Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jordan Money. I'm the Director of Events and Communications for the Center for Security Studies. And this is our first installment of our spring speaker series, The Future of Security. We are hearing from scholars and practitioners around the security field about emerging issues, new technologies, and the future of the security field itself. Um, a few logistical notes before we get started. Uh, you will see that you have been automatically muted. We are going to ask that all audience members stay off mute or on mute until the end of the session and then only unmute if you are going to ask a question. We will have time for Q&A at the end. We ask that uh, you hold on to your questions or just put them in the chat directly to me. I will be asking chat questions out loud or toward the end of the event, you may raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute so that you can ask your question directly. Please note that this is being recorded. So if you choose to ask a question out loud, your audio and your video, if you have your camera turned on, will appear in the recording. This will be posted to the YouTube channel for the Center for Security Studies uh, this week or next. Uh, with those logistical concerns out of the way, I would like to introduce Professor Javed Ali, who is an Associate Professor of Practice at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and an adjunct professor here at Georgetown University's Security Studies Program. He brings more than 20 years of professional experience in national security and intelligence issues. Uh, previously, he held positions all over Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area, including the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Federal Bureau of S Investigation. During his time at the FBI, he also held senior roles on joint duty assignments at the National Intelligence Council and the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, as well as the National Security Council under the Trump administration. He holds a BA in political science from the University of Michigan, a JD from the University of Detroit School of Law, and an MA in international relations from American University. He writes and provides commentary across far too many media sites and platforms to list in this introduction. Um, and I'm sure that his expertise will speak for itself once we get started. Uh, Professor Ali, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us today. No, Jordan, so great to uh, to be with you, um, Kirsten and others from the SSP team and uh, always happy to participate um, uh, with Georgetown, um, looking at some of the participants who've joined, I think I see a couple of former students as well when I was uh, teaching at Georgetown and, and some other uh, Washington DC colleagues. So thanks everyone for, for taking time out of your schedule today to be with us for uh, hopefully the next hour. And a pretty simple agenda uh, on my part for the discussion, hopefully. Um, I'll only be talking for about um, 30 minutes, or I'll try to, um, to stop at uh, 2.30. And I want to just cover three broad sort of issues looking um, at, at the counterterrorism uh, sort of environment and the counterterrorism missions, um, and then spend the, the next 30 minutes in Q&A. And hopefully um, you guys will poke holes in my arguments or, or tell me where I'm wrong, um, but definitely want to hear from, um, from folks uh, on the screen. So First, I want to talk about the evolving threat landscape. Um, and again, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative in terms of how I describe that. Then uh, I want to shift to where does counterterrorism right now in 2022 fit within the broader scale of or scope of, of uh, national security for the United States? I think we are past an inflection point with respect to counterterrorism no longer being the sole dominant national security issue for the US the way it was for what I would argue at least the first decade, if not the first 15 years after 9-11. And that's weirdly where I spent the bulk of my government time from 2002 to 2018. And then I wanna end uh, on policy challenges and whatever I try to present um, with that is, is not exhaustive, but if you were to just take a step back and think about um, sort of the, the threat landscape and where things are. What are the what are the challenges staring the US right now? And really welcome um, some conversation on that. So that's kind of the uh, the agenda. Um, and let's just kind of get right into it. Uh, those of you who've taken classes with me before know that when I do present slides, um, there's usually not a lot of words. And when there are words, they're usually somebody else's, not, not mine. 
Um, but what I do like doing are painting sort of pictures graphically to show kind of concepts or, or relationships or just kind of helping my own brain sort of understand uh, the way um, sort of different issues look. So again, here we are in 2022, thinking about the really diverse terrorist threat landscape to the United States at home and abroad. And if you were to think about it in a very simplistic way, I don't think these scales are equal right now, or if you're gonna use kind of the, the scale um, analogy of the, you know two, two things kind of weighted uh, on either side of some uh, linear plane. And what I, this uh, depiction of the threat environment, again, a little bit provocative, but this is where I think we are from a, a threat perspective in terms of what these, where these sort of big trajectories or, or threat sort of lines are going. And it's not to say that this is an absolute uh, accurate picture. Again, this is just my kind of more my more my sense based on my own experience, and then you know where the lines are are going from what I can see outside of government. Now, I obviously don't have anything uh, or I don't have access to any of the the classified uh, information like I did when I was in government. But I would argue that um, that the international terrorism threats to the United States, and again, I spent most of my career focused on this from 2002 to 2018, it's not that these threats and groups are going away, but I would argue is that our sense of what this means from a, even inside the US government counterterrorism prioritization um, spectrum, that this threat line might be moving in a different direction downward. Now, again, you can poke holes in that, um, certainly welcome some perspective on that during the Q&A, but if you were to look at this, this broad category, category of international terrorism threats to the United States, that encompasses a lot of different things. It's, it's not confined to just one particular um, group or one particular part of the threat spectrum. But um, when we at least looking at the, the post 9-11 world of international terrorism, um, suffice to say it's multifaceted. Uh, it's, uh, it's the jihadist group, so Al Qaeda and its affiliates, its ISIS and its branches, despite the relentless counterterrorism pressure and campaigns, both of those groups, and again, their, their networks have been under um, uh, for, for years, if not decades, certainly with respect to Al-Qaeda, that the groups are still around. Um, they may look different, they may operate differently, but they are not out of business and they definitely have not been militarily defeated, despite what policymaker statements have said in the past. And I think this, goes to show the resilience of these groups, um, even in the face of this relentless pressure that's been applied against them. And even when senior leaders, whether it's Osama bin Laden in 2011 for Al-Qaeda or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi for ISIS in 2019, even when you uh, eliminate or kill or capture a senior leader, the groups don't implode on their own and they still manage to um, sort of survive and, and have enough strategic depth to just pick somebody else to, to take that leadership uh, mantle and keep going forward. So I'm not suggesting these groups uh, are at the level that they were at their probably zenith, at their, at their height, but they're not completely out of business either. And I think that's something we have to acknowledge going forward. And then even moving beyond the formal groups, you know, this other category of um, homegrown violent extremists inspired by either the Al-Qaeda or the, uh, the ISIS uh, ideologies, narratives, uh, beliefs that are out there and have been out there for you know, so many years, this phenomena also has not gone away. I think it has definitely receded from its height, uh, I would argue, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and I was in the FBI then, and it looked, it looked bad then, um, but I don't think it's again, it's at that sort of peak of, of the threat um, that we saw almost a decade ago, but likewise, it hasn't gone away. And one of these really interesting kind of examples of this homegrown issue, and it's hard to understand where, if it fits in this category or not, but the recent hostage event in Texas with Ghulam uh, Akram, I mean, he was not an American homegrown extremist, but a British one apparently, and he came to the US to engage in some act of ideologically motivated violence, whether there was an Al-Qaeda agenda behind it or something else. And he kept bringing up Athia Siddiqui's name, who's a known Al-Qaeda member. Um, does that suggest that this HV issue isn't going away? It may not be at the scope and scale of what it was uh, previously, but I don't think it's zero either. So this is something we're still gonna have to wrestle with. 
And then shifting out of the jihadist um, kind of landscape, um, what does the Iranian threat look like from a terrorism perspective, not the conventional Iranian threat or the broader military threat from Iran? And as folks who are Iran uh, terrorism watchers know, Iran still uses uh, this you know, significant instrument of its own uh, military, the uh, IRGC Quds Force that used to be led by Qasem Soleimani. Now his former deputy is the head of the Quds Force. And, and that is Iran's external operations capability that allows it to engage in terrorism related activity or support to different groups like Hezbollah, like Shia militias uh, in Yemen, in, um, uh, in Syria, in Afghanistan, other parts of the Middle East to advance Iran's agendas, which may also align to the agendas of these locally based groups. So um, we haven't seen a major plot in the last couple of years with respect to at least an external plot associated with the Quds Force or Hezbollah. The Shia militias tend to be a little bit more locally focused, but that again, that doesn't mean that the, the broader strategic intent of, of these groups against the United States has receded uh, into the background. Um, also doesn't mean that they don't have the capability to attack us. Um, and one of the interesting questions now, more than two years after the, the US strike uh, against Qasem Soleimani, the former head of the Quds Force, you know, one of the questions I've been thinking about and have written about, has Iran responded um, in a way that they would feel you know, satisfies um, you know, Soleimani's death or, or you know, has the right level of of uh, revenge behind it. Um, and I don't think we know the answer to that yet. You know, have the Iranians tried to kickstart um, plots uh, against uh, the US and they've been foiled or, or thwarted or are they just playing a different game with a different agenda and motivation behind it? And maybe now they're waiting to see what happens on the, the nuclear negotiation uh, negotiations front before they launch some kind of retaliatory attack for the Soleimani um, uh, strike two years ago. So these are all open questions. Again, I don't think we know the answer, but this is where I would put this category of international terrorism uh, for the United States, both on these kind of two different ends of, of the threat spectrum, the jihadists and then the Iranians with, with other kind of Shia extremists. I still would argue that this threat category is still pointing down relative to the other uh, end of this threat spectrum now, which I would argue over the last um, decade has risen um, in uh, not only sort of influence and attention, but an actual threat. And um, it is also not monolithic. It is also multifaceted. Um, and what I think is so interesting about the domestic, the pure domestic terrorism threat to the United States now, and kind of looking where we are in the broader counterterrorism uh, world is that all the tools and capabilities and resources that author and authorities that allowed us to engage in this long uh, series of, of campaigns and fights against you know, this different collection of uh, groups overseas, almost none of them apply here domestically, right? And that, in a way, is why I think this threat is, is worsened over time, because we can't use the same tools, we can't use the same capabilities, and um, th we're still trying to get our hand hands around this threat um, uh, in the US. I wrote a, another pretty provocative op-ed about a year ago, um, building off of uh, Professor David Rappaport's Four Waves of Rebel Terrorism uh, paper that was published in 2000. If, if any of you who are terrorism um, analysts or, or scholars, if you haven't read that uh, paper, I would absolutely recommend it to you because it, I think this framework still holds. But I picked up on Professor Rappaport's um, framework and said that going back probably from the, the late 2000s, maybe to the early 2010s, that we've already been in this heightened wave or a, a, what I would call a new fifth wave of, of rebel terrorism that I call the new right threat. And, and again, these different kind of uh, movements and ideas and, and beliefs and sometimes even groups are, have filled that fifth um, wave um, uh, kind of spectrum. And this is, this is, it's not new, but it's different. And the intensity of it is, is different. And I also don't think January 6th was the culmination of this wave 
peaking. If you look at Professor Rappaport's previous four waves that he described, um, uh, he believed that each one of those waves that went from the 1880s to the to 2000 when the article was published um, lasted about 20 to 40 years. And so if you buy into this wave theory and you buy into my hypothesis that we're in this fifth wave already, that maybe we're somewhere close to the middle of it if it's a 20 year wave, but in the worst case, and that's the best case scenario, the worst case scenario is that the upward, upward part of the slope is only beginning if it's a 40 year wave. And because I generally am very pessimistic when it comes to terrorism threats, I would say that, again, I think we're in a 40 year wave and January 6th to me is more of an anomaly in terms of what the threat is gonna look like. I would argue what the threat's gonna look like for several years, if not several decades, is the threat we've already seen from the, the mid 2010s. It's gonna be lone wolf attacks or small groups coming together against, uh, you know, latching onto any of these beliefs that I've described um, in the domestic terrorism column. And those will be the ideas and beliefs and narratives that motivate those people to violent action. And we've seen, you know, tragically in this country um, over that stretch of time in the last decade, you know, several lethal successful plots. And I think we'll continue to see those. Weirdly enough, 2021, it seems to be an outlier. I don't believe there was a single, and thankfully, single successful lethal plot um, from someone who would be latching on to any of these um, uh, you know, these categories in the domestic terrorism column. But is that a tactical lull because of the, the heavy pressure that's now on some of these uh, individuals and groups and, and movements? The fact the Biden administration has clearly moved out on this. They've published a, a national strategy for domestic terrorism. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think there's some tension there, but I don't think we've seen the last of this threat. I think we've, we're gonna see more of these plots um, going forward from from across this diverse threat spectrum. So that's kind of my take on where we are on the threat spectrum between international and domestic. I think the domestic one is rising in intensity. I would argue the international terrorism one is receding, but not completely eliminated. But all it will take is a major act of terrorism against U.S. interests abroad or, um, or worst case here in the homeland from one of these groups or actors in the international terrorism category to, to change that conversation. So again, this is just more for um, kind of um, getting people to, to think about what um, your own position is when it comes to threats. And then if we can move off the threat um, part of it, now let's try to look at counterterrorism within this broader basket of really important national security issues. And again, those of you who've seen uh, my um, classes before, you're gonna to have to suffer through the uh, PowerPoint uh, um, display here. But um, in my opinion, these are the equally important national security issues that are all happening at the same time in which counterterrorism is now being looked at relative to these, to these other issues. And it's a really tough threat environment overall. And, and this is what I think makes the Biden administration uh, or, you know, this is one of the key challenges for the Biden administration when it comes to national security is of the ones that I've just painted here on this PowerPoint slide, which of these is number one and which is number seven or which is number eight? And how do you realign and reprioritize resources and capabilities and people and, uh, and budget and money around the thing that now should be number one versus now, uh, you know, number seven or number eight? My sense um, from you know, listening to what people are saying in the Biden administration, if you if folks haven't seen a document that was published in um, in March, pretty quietly, not with a lot of fanfare. I mean, they published it, but didn't get sort of the attention that a, a full up um, uh, administration's national security strategy um, would. Um, in March, the administration published uh, something called the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance, kind of a long term, kind of wonky sounding title. But it's actually the first time uh, in at least the modern history of the NSC, or probably any history of the NSC over the last 70 plus years, that this kind of interim document has come out from an administration um, and not waiting for a year or a year plus um, to, to have the actual full up national security strategy come out to, to tell you what the administration's uh, 
priorities are going to be. So if you haven't looked at that document, you should. Um, but I think when you do look at it, it basically says that counterterrorism is no, no, no longer the number one national security priority for the U.S. And if you, to her, if you were to have read the other national security strategies published under Bush and Obama, um, you would get the sense that counterterrorism was still up there, um, certainly if not number one, you know, maybe uh, number two or number three. But if you read the March document, it's not that they're saying counterterrorism isn't important. They're not that they're saying counterterrorism won't be a focus area, but they're not. They're also saying that it's not, again, the overriding national security priority that just sort of exhausts all the energy and all the attention and all the resources and all the capabilities. So um, even reading that document, it's hard to say which of these other sort of bubbles on the slide are number one. Is it great power competition? Is it climate change? Obviously with COVID, that is not just a public health issue, that is a national security uh, issue as well. And so um, I, I think that's what makes this topic so difficult right now for this administration is that they don't have the luxury of just focusing on one thing or, or going really deep on one thing the way other administrations could do, certainly in the first decade, if not you know, 15 years after 9-11. The threat board is, is so fundamentally um, different. And I think it'll be fascinating to see going forward um, when and if the Biden administration does put out their national security strategy. Again, how will it springboard off the March 2021 document? Will it have changed even in that, that interim? Um, and um, you know, where counterterrorism fits uh, from the administration's uh, point of view. So I think this is something we're all gonna um, sort of be looking for when, uh, when the document comes out. And then just kind of ending on, on this slide, um, if you think of you know, the, the policy challenges facing the United States, we've already talked about too, this persistent multifaceted um, threat at home and abroad, clearly competition for counterterrorism with other national security priorities. But if you, I would argue some of these other um, circles also bring up uh, issues that will be challenges for, for counterterrorism and they're all interrelated. And maybe the way I presented the slide isn't the most effective use of the graphic, um, but I tried to sort of represent that all these issues are interconnected at some level and absolutely will have an impact on counterterrorism going forward, whether it's priority number one or priority number seven or eight. So we've already seen the administration make some really bold policy decisions when it comes to diminishing our overseas military presence, at least in places in which in that post 9-11 era, we had troops on the ground for you know, mostly counterterrorism or counterinsurgency purposes. The Afghanistan decision obviously was, was sort of the, the bellwether for that. Um, and unlike other parts of the world where we still have a relatively small US troop presence that will uh, focus or can focus on uh, counterterrorism um, responsibilities or, or work with local partners to build up their capacity or train, advise, assist. In Afghanistan, the, the president made this really bold decision to take that, that combat presence anyways down to zero. Um, and that's now, I mean, is there a scenario in which we will have to go back? Maybe, but I think the only scenario that would have, you know, troops, if you're to think about this picture, you know, having the picture be completely opposite, you know, uh, aircraft landing um, somewhere in Afghanistan, troops coming out of, of an aircraft or a helicopter instead of coming in. I think the only scenario for this administration where that's going to happen is, um, is some kind of massive terrorist attack launched out of Afghanistan, even if the Taliban isn't um, supporting it or, or somehow winning of it. Um, but absent that, I just don't see us going back into a place like Afghanistan you know, once the president made, made that decision. So this is going to be something we're going to have to wrestle with going forward. When, when you make a decision like that, what is the impact on counterterrorism? Certainly in, in this part of the world where there are still um, jihadist groups there um, that still may harbor the intention to attack the United States, whether locally, regionally, or, or worst case in the homeland. Um, and we'll just have to see how this plays out going forward. Another thing I've thought about in, in this diminishing overseas military presence, certainly when it comes to Afghanistan, is there, is there uh, some kind of construct where the US would engage in, in some type of relationship with the Taliban, which seems pretty um, 
that seemed pretty unthinkable even a few years ago, where there's some level of counterterrorism cooperation. It's very transactional, um, but still, we, it's in our interest to make sure Afghanistan isn't a launch pad for external operations. And I also think now with the Taliban back in power, it's in their interest as well. Um, so whether that happens or not, nobody knows, but I'd be curious if, if there is some kind of construct that, that gets rolled out where um, both sides will cooperate um, you know, very transactionally for, for counterterrorism. And then kind of a related point, um, even outside you know, an area of active hostilities like uh, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, where else around the world do we have these counterterrorism partnerships, um, either through the military or the, or the intelligence community? And what will those look? What will those look like going forward? Will they kind of some say status quo? Will we boost up our presence in some parts of the world, um, even for a more limited counterterrorism purpose, or like in the areas of uh, you know these combat zones or hot battlefields? Will we also start to to scale even these small presences back to to realign and, and re-equip and, and refocus on other issues, whether it's great power competition? Or anything else. So these are all. This is another thing to to watch going forward when it comes to sort of a, a policy issue. Um, I spent a lot of time now that I'm out of government thinking about kind of legal gaps and seams and, and authorities issues. Uh, and and maybe that's just because I, I'm not faced with the the pressure and the time constraints when you're in counterterrorism in government, where you generally don't have to think about those things. At least when in some certain uh, roles, if you're not on on the legal side, but taking a step back and having the time to contemplate, you know, looking at the legal and the policy architecture, I think there are still some, some issues that need to be resolved. On the foreign side, um, and there are probably several of you, you know, probably smarter uh, on this than me, what do we do with authorities like the 2001 uh, authorization to use military force, which was initially designed to allow um, the campaign against Al Qaeda and the Taliban, but 20 plus years later, has that authority outlived its utility? Does it need to be um, mothballed altogether or adjusted on the margins to still give um, the military and the intelligence community the, the flexibility they need to, to pursue counterterrorism campaigns overseas, even if Al Qaeda isn't the number one um, terrorist threat? So again, open question. Um, Similar policy issue, the, not only is there the 2001 authorization to use military force that's still in the books, but there's the 2002 authorization to use military force that was much more Iraq centric. Um, and it has allowed the US to, to keep combat troops there. Um, uh, obviously, initially that was to, to, uh, um, to be used against the, the regime, the Hussein regime in Iraq, but 20 plus years later now, um, do we need to keep those troops there for counterterrorism or counterinsurgency purposes. And again, the, there are hot debates about this in Congress uh, right now. And then, um, and those are just two things. That, that's not, those aren't the only two things. And then on the domestic side, um, what do we do about the lack of a actual crime of domestic terrorism, even though we have a definition of domestic terrorism? And that is why, even with the lethal plots we've had over the past several years and um, all the people charged and arrested in the aftermath of January 6th, what, over 750 or whatever that number is right now, um, the word terrorism doesn't show up legally on, on the charging side, may happen on the sentencing side, but you, none of these people have been charged with acts, federal crimes of domestic terrorism, because again, the crime doesn't exist in law. So will we see some movement on that from this Congress or another one with respect to um, putting a federal crime of domestic terrorism, whether in the Patriot Act or somewhere else that matches the existing definition. Don't know the answer to that. Another one of these legal gaps and seams on the domestic terrorism front, um, even though we have, there are movements and, and um, there are also groups that, that operate within movements, but we don't have a domestic terrorist organization list the way we have a foreign terrorist organization list. And that's why people who might be part of these formal groups here in the US can't be charged with material support to terrorism because there's no list to charge them with, much the way you can charge people with supporting ISIS and Al Qaeda. Like the, the woman who was arrested in Syria and brought back to face charges here, uh, the news has broken on that over the past um, few days, Allison Fluke, 
Ekron, she was charged with material support to ISIS. Um, she actually was embedded with ISIS, kind of a different story, but still, there is a standing list of foreign terrorist organizations that the US State Department manages. We have nothing like that on the domestic um, side. And I know that makes a lot of people nervous about even thinking about that. But again, is that is that something we need to deal with what I would argue is this rising threat of domestic terrorism here? Don't know the answer, but at least put it out there as sort of a as a as a question to contemplate. And then um, looking at the, the resource angle, counterterrorism, um, certainly after 9-11, was drawing a lot of the not only the policy attention, but the money, the people. Um, the capabilities um, that enabled these counterterrorism operations uh, overseas. But I, I, my sense is over the last three, four years, that landscape is shifting. And now there's been a reallocation to other uh, important national security priorities, certainly when it comes to great power competition. So the less counterterrorism gets to perform you know, the broad mission, um, certainly overseas, how do you do that when the diversity of the threat spectrum is still pretty wide. So it's trying to do more with less. And that obviously is going to make some hard choices when it comes to accepting risk and, and acknowledging trade-offs. And then I'll just kind of end on the technology front. This is something that is still accelerating pretty quickly. Uh, and I would argue is another reason why the domestic terrorism issue started to rise in prominence is that increase in the technology wave that was happening in the late 2000s into the early 2010s, that has been another one of these key factors that's led to the, to the growth in this. Uh, obviously, international terrorism um, threats and groups have, have used these technologies too, but this just presents more challenges when you think about it from the domestic side. Um, and this also appears to be one of these policy arenas where the federal government doesn't seem to be weighing in pretty heavily with respect to legislation, executive orders. And because the technology companies own the, the platforms, the technology themselves, I would think that the um, solutions, uh, at least on the, the counterterrorism solutions that are gonna come out of this, will have to be driven by them and not the government or the heavy hand of the government per se. And um, this, again, is going to be something that will be really interesting to watch. And part of this is because the technology moves so fast. By the time the government figures out a solution to, to address it, you, you're already onto the next technology wave. So I think here, unlike some of these other policy challenges, the, um, the leadership in this arena is going to come from the companies themselves, the private sector versus the government telling folks um, what to do. So Jordan, with that, let me stop. Um, it's been about 30 minutes and hopefully we'll get into some, some uh, questions and um, some discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Um, do you want to go ahead and stop screen sharing so yep. that uh, we can see everybody's faces? Um, as I said previously, you may put your questions in the chat. You can also use the raise hand function on Zoom and I will call on you and allow you to unmute yourself. Um, we do have one question uh, that came in from uh, Lauren. Do you think the over the horizon strategy is an adequate way to respond to the terrorism threat emanating out of Afghanistan? Yeah, it's a great um, question, Lauren. And for those of you following sort of the, the policy kind of evolution on Afghanistan, you know, once the president made the decision to remove the combat um, presence, um, you've had other leaders um, talk about national security leaders talk about, well, it's not as if the U.S. is walking away from, from um, Afghanistan completely. It's not as if um, we are kind of abandoning our counterterrorism responsibilities, if that's the right term. You know, there's these cryptic comments to this over the horizon um, capability. Uh, and there's another construct that's been used. I just can't remember it right now. But um, as someone who kind of knows the ins and outs of this, in a place like Afghanistan, if you don't have the ability to, at a really granular level to understand what threats look like and where people are coming and going, and counterterrorism is a is a at a kind of operational level is about tracking people, right? That is, it's different than other national security priorities that you're not looking necessarily at the movement of human beings as closely as you are. Counterterrorism without that presence on the ground to have that more refined uh, 
understanding and certainly working with local partners who also have a probably even deeper ability to understand that I, it's just going to make it harder now does it make it exponentially harder just a couple of degrees off from where we were previously nobody knows the answer to that but this notion of having the over the horizon capability and still maintaining the the uh, you know the, the capabilities to to go after um, threats or plots or, or targets as they emerge, we'll see how that works out. I mean, hopefully that keeps um, that keeps us safe. But um, we've seen this story play out in in history, where if we leave a, a country, if we leave a a conflict zone, we don't have the ability to understand what's happening on the ground in a way we did before. It just opens up more risk. Now, hopefully, we can close that with. Um, whatever the plan is going forward, but I just don't think we know the answer to that yet, but it's a great question to ask. Thank you for that question and thank you for the response as well. Uh, Alexandra, I see you have a question. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I learned a lot already. Um, I'm excited that you have a JD because I'm, I'm applying to law school right now, which is not fun. And um, I wanna study international law. And I thought it was really interesting that you brought up the legal gaps. And I wanted to ask your expert opinion on two things. One, you discussed this woman that just came back from Syria, we extradited her back and we're charging her for you know material support. We recently brought back as well another woman who was an ISIS bride, and she admitted to crimes against humanity. She admitted to buying slaves, child slaves for sex for her husband. She paid for them. She admitted them on tape. We did not charge her for that. It's not our jurisdiction. And obviously, the International Criminal Court is not the United States friend. So my first question is, how do, how do we how do we fix that problem? Because she got seven years in prison and she was obviously doing horrible things. My next question is, we have these, we have these Americans go, go to Syria, go to Iraq, join these terrorist groups, and we bring them back and they get, you know, maybe maximum 20 years for, for that for that. However, if I go to Russia and I join their state-owned military, that's treason. So why are we not charging these terrorists for treason? Because generally speaking, it's the same thing. The only difference is one is state-owned and one is not. So I'm just curious what your opinion is on all of that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alexandra. Really good question. And let me um, put the caveat out there. I have a law degree, but I never practiced law. And I had I done that, I truly would have been the world's worst attorney. So I think I saved the legal profession from just having another bad lawyer uh, in their in their midst. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, I'm actually teaching a class now here at Michigan that looks at the intersection of, of national security and the law. But again, I was never a practicing uh, attorney um, per se. Um, on the on the uh, question um, about uh, sort of um, kind of the the charging aspect, wasn't that sort of your your first one with respect to um, you know why are some people charged with crimes at a certain level and with with others? I mean, this is just again we're we're operating within the legal framework that we that we have, and if you um, if you go to a place like Iraq and Syria and you try to join uh, a group like ISIS, that is illegal under US law because these are prescribed foreign terrorist organizations under, under um, I think it's section 219 of the Immigration and National Security or Immigration uh, Naturalization Act. That's where the foreign terrorist organization you know, list uh, resides. Um, but uh, and that is what allows prosecutors to bring these material support charges. You can even bring those same material support charges for people arrested here who've never traveled. But if you are ideologically inspired by these foreign groups that are on the list, if you provide some kind of material support to them, whether it's money, material, uh, any some other kind of provisions, again, you will be charged with material support. We just can't do that with domestic-based organizations because we don't have that list of domestic terrorist organizations or any kind of material support clause that, that links to the two. So that's kind of one of the challenges. And on your treason question, um, that's another really interesting uh, one to, 
to um, to think about. Yeah, I don't. You'd have, probably have to talk to someone at DOJ. Like, why charge someone with material support versus um, treason? Even if you could theoretically apply both sets of charges against them, I think sometimes that just comes down to the evidence that you have in front of you and what evidence you think you think as a prosecutor will hold up best um, in a court of law, because what prosecutors, federal prosecutors don't want to do is take a weak case to court, right, and and risk the higher possibility of losing. And I don't know what the burden of proof is on treason versus material support. But uh, when it comes to the recent history or the post 9-11 history of, of counterterrorism prosecutions, um, at least the ones domestically, they, against you know people inspired or, or um, providing actual support to these groups overseas, they're all falling in, in that material support end of the spectrum. So I just think it's a it's a it's a tried and true kind of thing. I don't know again if that burden of proof or if the cases get even more complicated um, with treason. And when you think about Russia Ukraine, well, you're not these aren't prescribed terrorist organizations you're talking about. There's you know, these state conflicts that are now emerging. And I just, I'm not smart enough to know what the law says on, on that front. Thank you. And I see we have a couple of hands raised. I'm actually going to real quick ask a question from the chat though, because I think it ties in nicely with what you were just discussing. Uh, Robert asks, how would your concept of a domestic terrorism threat list differ from what was formerly known as the attorney general's list of subversive organizations? Well, again, I think that's where privacy and civil liberties groups going back to the 1960s and 70s kind of cringe at that notion that, you know, we've seen this in our history in the country, not recent history, but you know, 50, 60 years ago, where armed with these authorities, FBI or, or uh, the intelligence committee, would sort of then engage in collection uh, or other types of activities against Americans who may have only been exercising their constitutionally protected rights. So um, the, the critics of even the notion of a domestic terrorist organization, listen, I'm not saying there shouldn't be criticism of it, um, would say that who gets to decide which group stays on the list, who falls off, um, what are the authorities that that enable some kind of action by the FBI or or others? And again, really important questions. Um, but I guess the thing I'm trying to suggest, without advocating one side or the other, at least have a conversation about what that looks like, given what the threat looks like here in the United States. I just don't think status quo, from a legal perspective, is is enough, given the severity of the threat. Unless we just want to keep suffering these kind of attacks, which I don't think anybody thinks is acceptable, right? So um, at least let's have that conversation about what some kind of, you know, the framework for uh, a domestic terrorist organization list, or even adding groups, uh, formal groups that operate here, but also have some um, uh, activity overseas and put them on the foreign terrorist organization list. And maybe that's a way you sort of split the difference. I think there's a really interesting test case for a group like that. I don't know how familiar people are with a group called The Base, which is an ultra-violent white supremacy neo-Nazi group that um, may be on its back foot or maybe not. Um, it's pretty small, uh, operates in clandestine cells, but they only organize to do one thing, and that's to conduct ideologically motivated attacks against innocent civilians here in the United States. And the leader of that group, a guy named Ronaldo Nazaro, Last known location was somewhere in St. Petersburg, Russia, right? And there have been other um, base cells in, in different parts of the world, including uh, one or two in Canada. So do we use a group like the base that, again, has this very violent agenda and ideology? Um, there have been lots of people, over a dozen uh, in 2019 and 2020, arrested by the FBI who were engaged in an actual plotting. These weren't people just thinking about it. They were taking concrete steps for violent action. Is that a group where you sort of explore the parameters of what you know what you can do with a, a group like that and either putting them on a new list or adding them to the FTO list? I don't know. But again, I, I like to think that there's now is the time to try to explore something new as opposed to just relying on status quo. Yeah, 
Thank you. Um, Melvin, you have been patiently waiting to ask your question. Go ahead. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? Hi, Melvin. Uh, I have a question for you. Just kind of looking at the rapid and uh, really seems from my perspective as old army guy, uh, unsophisticated removal of troops out of Afghanistan. It doesn't seem kind of interesting that we still have troops in Iraq, South Korea, Germany, Japan, and Italy. It just seems that someone has decided that uh, they were going to take a back step for political reasons, which may leave us open for a lot more uh, opportunities for harm later on. That's kind of the first one. What do you think on that? And then on the domestic side, um, I, I kind of see how some people may want to do kind of target some particular groups who seem to be that outlandish in America, but it tends to then bubble over into the political climate of conflict we have right now, because then some will defend and say you're, you're overstepping. And it's almost better just to use the law with plotting attacks and conspiracy and whatnot to lead that fight against people like that. I just leave it open for your, your response and your comment. Thank you. Yeah, Melvin, thanks for your questions. Um, you know, circling back to Afghanistan issue, you know, I talked about that a little bit. Obviously, you know, significant policy decision um, that, you know, just raises a lot of questions because as you noted, we have troops on the ground in lots of other parts of the world. And even the troop presence in Afghanistan up until the summer was relatively small, about I think 2,500. So compare that to the troop presence um, in places like um, South Korea, obviously we have 55,000 troops, uh, different constellation of, of forces in Europe under the NATO um, umbrella. So the, I don't think the issue is US troops overseas. I think it might be location of US troops in certain um, countries. And again, after 20 years of a long grinding conflict in a place like Afghanistan against Al Qaeda, then the Taliban, other um, jihadist groups or other insurgent groups, you know, the Biden administration just made a very bold decision to leave. Now, by leaving, though, as you rightly know, we are accepting a lot of risk there. And even if we can minimize that or prevent it with some kind of over the horizon capability, although I'm not sure we all on the outside kind of know what that, that means, but that was a policy decision that, that was made. Um, and now, once we've made the decision, we're going to have to live with the consequences of that, you know, hopefully, again, we don't see these sophisticated external plots emerge of, out of Afghanistan the way they did, um, like in the pre 9 11 era. And hopefully, the Taliban will do something about the jihadist groups in their midst. And it, but these are all things of which we don't know uh, the answer uh, to yet. And uh, so, hopefully, I kind of address that for you. Um, and on the domestic side, again, this is another really interesting um, issue because this is also seems to be something that is uh, affected by very political and, and partisan um, perspectives. You know, there are some folks who acknowledge that the threat is, is significant, whether you agree that we're in a fifth wave or not, you know, like I have said, that's a different story, but at least acknowledge that there's, you know, there's a higher level of activity than in, in recent years, and it may uh, be increasing in intensity and scope. And there's others who are on the complete opposite of the spectrum saying these are all sort of concocted and there re really isn't this um, uh, prominent of a domestic terrorism threat. And so unfortunately the domestic terrorism issue has also been um, kind of boxed around by domestic politics. Um, but if we were to see another large event happen and nobody wants that to happen, but if it does happen, um, then I think that's gonna to start to change the conversation even more about are we doing enough to prevent something big from happening, whether it looks like January 6th, whether it looks like Oklahoma City, even uh, I've been, I was in Washington for 26 years and now I'm back in Michigan. Um, but as I moved back here uh, in the fall of 2020, there was a pretty serious plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan and that, and I was giving a lot of media commentary about that at the time and I said, Look, what, whatever you think about the 14 individuals charged and arrested for the Governor Whitmer plot, they were intent on engaging in that activity. And this wasn't just campfire chit chat. They were taking concrete steps. And it looked like, you know, comparing to the size and the scope of some of these, perhaps not the sophistication, but at least the size and the scope of these international terrorism plots we saw directed against the US from abroad, it kind of reminded me of that, even though this was purely domestic. So this domestic terrorism issue is not 
going away and whether it's big or whether it's small, it's going to be with us um, for some time. But I think we got to get past the partisan political aspect of it and just look at it objectively to come up with some smart solutions. Because if we just stay in our political lanes on this, we're not going to make much progress. I think that final line could apply to an awful lot of things <laughs> in politics right the about bumper now. sticker, right, exactly. Um, it looks like we have time for one, maybe two more questions, depending on how quickly we go. Uh, Justin, you can go ahead. Uh, hey, Professor, thanks for doing this. Uh, I learned a lot today. I um, wanted to ask you, and you kind of hinted a little bit uh, about this towards the base and then kind of what you were just talking about. But uh, I'm wondering if there's any substantial amount of evidence that kind of shows foreign powers are radicalizing uh, these homegrown extremists, you know, like in Iran or China or Russia, um, with the intent to make the US crumble from within? Um, or is it mainly based out of these, you know, political fringe groups that are kind of radicalizing themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would I would like to think my former colleagues in the intelligence community are looking pretty hard at this. And, you know, we've seen, um, or at least, you know, what's been reported publicly, what Russia tried to do in 2016 with respect to their multifaceted campaign, campaign to sort of influence and undermine the 2016 elections, that didn't seem to have an overt sort of bent in terms of, um, Sort of radicalizing extremists here. It had more of again this sort of partisan political um, agenda. But um, now that Russia and and other countries have seen sort of that playbook, is there another playbook that they can open up, or they're already actively using to kind of foment um, the discontent and the discord that that does feed into the narratives and the beliefs that um, people on the more kind of extremist side of the spectrum are thinking about here might. My, my intuition is telling me yes, but I can't prove that empirically. It'd be fascinating to see what really smart kind of academic scholars and researchers could find on that. But it just seems to fit into their overall agenda. Like if you already have kind of weaponized those capabilities previously in the US for a more sort of political purpose, why not then also try to stoke those same kind of flames on the extremism side? Because they will also have a really negative corrosive effect here as well. So again, my intuition tells me it's happening, but I can't lay out the, you know, the case for the jury to say that it, that it is. All right, we will make time for one final question. Uh, so Sam, you'll make it quick and Professor Ali, make your response quick, hopefully as well. Uh, hey, Professor, thanks for your time. Um, I'll try and keep it quick. Most of the people, when they talk about terrorism these days, they 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 talk about continuity. Okay, jihadist groups and then right wing right wing extremist groups. They talk about similarities, continuities. I'm curious how you see dissimilarities or discontinuities and how that should affect a counterterrorism strategy. Yeah, great question, Sam. Thank you. Clearly, when you look at these two ends of the threat spectrum, I think there are some um, similarities, but there may be more differences than we think. I think what makes the domestic terrorism issue pretty interesting, even um, in the far right category, and that's not the only aspect of it, but even looking at the far right, um, to me, it's almost, it's sort of one level up from the international terrorism um, side of the spectrum where you're talking about these broad sort of ideological movements from which groups can spin out of or individuals mobilized by the ideology, but you don't see the same for the most part, outside of the, 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 the known groups that we know of, you don't see the same kind of structure and bureaucracy and, and organization uh, of a group like Al Qaeda or an ISIS or some of their branches or, or, or groups in the network. That's what I think makes the domestic terrorism challenge even harder. It's, it's, to me, it seems more amorphous. You can pick out a group, you can pick out a base, you can pick out um, you know, an Adam Waffen division, you can pick out uh, an anti-government group, um, you know, a militia, but those might be more the anomalies. If anything, you've got multiple ideologies all sort of percolating and permeating this uh, this ecosystem, and people can latch onto these and sometimes believe in multiple ideologies at the same time, and then they spin out and then try to do something violently. And that seems to be a, little, a lot different than what you see on the jihadist end of the spectrum. Yeah, 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ali, uh, for joining us today. I know that there were a couple of questions in the chat that we didn't quite get to, um, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you as well to everyone in the audience who has joined us today. Uh, if you are interested in hearing more about the future of security, I mentioned that this is a weekly series. Some of these events will be closed to the public, but next week's is open. We will be talking with Dr. Amy Zegert about her new book, Spies, Lies, and Algorithms, The History and Future of American Intelligence. Um, I dropped the link to that event in the chat. So you're, if you're interested, you can find out more information there. Thank you again, Javed Ali, and take care, everyone. Thanks, guys.